Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming on the panel about Chinese role for global development and security. Uh, we have uh, strategical changes in the world nowadays. We have a lot of challenges, but those challenges sometimes are very interesting. And uh, I think that one of the amazing phenomena in a global arena is uh, Chinese success. And right now, before we are going to open our panel, we are going to see one video. It is natural that China should translate its economic and scientific power into political and military presence on the international scene. It wants to have a major say in the design of the emerging global world order. But what would its contribution be like? This panel should seek to clarify China's objectives in terms of its international role. Welcome to the panel, China's role for global development and security. Okay. When I used to be president uh, more than 10 years ago, the, everyone in the Western world was uh, looking to the China as a positive uh, example. And uh, many people in the Western countries were very happy with the development that China has been delivering. And uh, to underline the few uh, unbelievable successes China delivered within a few decades of reforms after uh, legendary Deng Xiaoping until uh, legendary Xi Jinping. Uh, eradication from the poverty, approximately 800 million people, is really unbelievable achievement. Many people are talking about that, but I'm putting that in the context of migration and crisis in Europe that happened during the Syria crisis and the war in the Middle East. And can you imagine Europe that was extremely affected, that very vulnerable because of five million migrants that were trying to come to Europe. In the context of China, without such a brilliant achievement of eradication of the poverty, 800 million people. Can you imagine Europe to be affected politically in terms of economy if Europe is it going to be faced with uh, such migrations coming from China? In that respect, everything what China has been doing in terms of reforms is uh, really amazing. That was also protection of Chinese future, but that was contribution of China to the global peace and development. Nowadays, we are talking about China, which is one of the leading countries in technology development. China is uh, creating fantastic results in many, many aspects of new technologies. For example, Huawei is a leading company in telecommunication in terms of five generation, fifth generation of telecommunication. This is something unbelievable. And unfortunately, I have to say that many Western countries that have been leading process in that respect in 1990s cannot reach Huawei in technological improvement. Also, we can talk about other aspects, unfortunately, we are living in a very difficult time. We are talking about the war, which is occupying everyone who is responsible right now in international arena. But without taking into consideration the role of China as a global power, we cannot understand the future of the mankind. In that respect, I think this panel is capable to offer kind of answers on challenges we are facing with, to understand the role of China, especially in the context of the world nowadays. Central Asia, we have experts for that. In terms of relations between China and the United States, China and the European Union, China and Japan, China and South Korea, China and North Korea, and China and ASEAN countries. Many challenges, and I hope that this panel is going to offer many responses. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and now, your Excellency, Mr. Wu, would you like to present your view regarding Chinese role in the world nowadays? Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. 
this is the first time for me to be here. So as a new boy in town, I was given the honor to speak first. So I will behave myself. <laughs> Your Honorable Former President Boris Tadic, dear panelists, ladies and gentlemen, over the past three years, Great changes have been taking place both in China and worldwide. Devastating war, as mentioned by a modest reader, broke out again in Europe. Economic globalization and the economic development suffered great setbacks. The pandemic and the climate changes are taking heavy tones on humanity. Our world is being troubled with increasing uncertainty and instability. Our community, our society is confronted with the grave security and development cha challenges unseen for years. There can be no development without security, and no security without development. On this very important topic, wisely chosen by our hosts, I wish to share with you three key points. Number one, common development. This features strongly in the Chinese foreign policies. Among the Chinese initiatives and the proposals, from my point of view, the most worth mentioning is the Global Development Initiative, GDI, proposed by my president, Mr. Xi Jinping, in the United Nations in 2021. The initiative is based on six major pillars. Number one, development, development as a priority. Number two, a people-centered approach. Number three, benefits for all. Number four, innovation driven. Number five, harmony between man and the nature. Number six, results-oriented actions. Ladies and gentlemen, we have heard so many high-sounding words about how to help help the poor and how to bring up our economy. But nothing happened. What we need is action-oriented and results-oriented actions. Well, this, can be, this has been supported by more than 100 countries and many international organizations, with over 60, 60 countries joining the friends of a GDI group. As a large country, China's own development has a great impact on the world. By 2021, China successfully helped close to 100 million people out of extreme poverty. As the moderator rightly pointed out, since the reform and opening up policy in China in 1970s, we managed to help over 800 million people out of poverty. This has great impact on the world situation, and we contributed the largest part uh, to the United Nations in its program to eliminate poverty. And this close to 100 million people 
target is 10 years ahead of the United Nations schedule, which is 2030. And China is now taking concrete actions to honor its solemn commitment of achieving carbon peak before 2030 and the carbon neutrality before 2060. The last panel <clears throat> was talking about energy. China is one of the largest energy cons consumption country, but efforts are obvious to see. Almost most the electric cars are really on the Chinese streets. So we are trying our best. The 20th National Congress of Chinese Communist Party last year clearly defined the Chinese modernization attracting wide interest and attention. The reason why? Because the Chinese modernization is unprecedented. Unlike the previous Western modernizations, the Chinese modernization stands out distinctly with the five important features. Number one, a huge population. That is obvious. If you count the people living in developed countries, how much you get? About one billion. How many people we have in China, in one country alone? 1.4 billion. Imagine you would bring 1.4 billion people into industrialized and modernized country without grabbing overseas colonies, without seeking natural resources or bring slaves home, but you still want to modernize. So that is one difference. Number two, common prosperity for all. Nowadays, we have been talking about the widening gap between the rich and the poor. I heard some uh, panelists in the previous panel saying that during the pandemic period, the rich get richer and poor get poorer. That is not the way China would proceed to. We want prosperity for each and everyone in China. Nobody will be left out. Number three, combination of material and cultural ethical advancement. It sounds rather philosophical. Now, you have a material benefits, like say, in one big country, the people enjoy GDP per capita, that is say, $50,000 per person. In China, it's just 10,000. However, you see people taking drugs on the streets, people shooting each other in the schools, or people discriminate against colored people. Is that kind of modernization we want? Do we think that country can possibly explain that they are a modernized country? No, that's not our standard. Number four, harmony between humanity and the nature, of course, the environmental protection. I don't need to elaborate on that. Last but not least, that is very important, peaceful development. People suggest that when big power is rising, it's inevitable there will be war against the old powers. That is not the way we want. We want a peaceful development. Now I wish to emphasize here, China's development is people-centered, sustainable, and peaceful for the promoting uh, of uh, common prosperity for all. We never intend to surpass or replace anyone in the world. Our real challenge is how to develop better for our people by exceeding ourselves to the rest of the world, 
China is development. China's development means opportunities, not threats. China is your partner, not your rival. Second point, security for all. Security and development go hand in hand. However, security that covers only a few countries or block of countries will not last long. To seek absolute security for oneself at the expenses of others will lead to disastrous end. In view of what happened in Ukraine, it is urgent for us to find a global security arrangement that would ensure a better and a safer world for all. In April 22nd, President Xi Jinping announced the Global Security Initiative, GSI, stressing that we should stay committed to one, the vision of a common and comprehensive cooperative and a sustainable security. Second, respecting sovereignty and territory integrity of all the countries. Number three, abiding by the purpose and the principles of the United Nations Charter. Number four, taking legitimate concern for security of all countries seriously. Number five, peacefully resolving differences and disputes between countries through dialogue and consultation. And last but not least, maintaining security in both traditional and non-traditional domains. He provided the Chinese answer to the urgent global security question. In the last February, China released the Global Security Initiative concept paper, further elaborating the Chinese position on world security issue. It has demonstrated my country's strong determination to safeguard world peace and global security. I reach my last point, Ukraine and Taiwan. On the Ukraine issue, China's position can be summarized by one short sentence. Supporting talks for peace. Last month, we released China's position on political settlement of Ukraine crisis. I suggest, if you may have time, just read it through and try to find out who is calling for dialogue and the peace, and who is adding fuel to the fire by escalating the tension. China will continue to stand firmly for peace and dialogue, and work constructively to de-escalate the conflict and ease the tense situation. Taiwan is the most unlikely issue to be mentioned here. However, some people suggested that today's Ukraine will be tomorrow's Taiwan. So I feel the necessity to respond briefly. This is completely absurd. Taiwan and Ukraine are not comparable at all. As recognized internationally, Taiwan is part of China, and Taiwan issue is the internal affairs of China, whereas Ukraine is an issue between two sovereign powers, Ukraine and Russia. Well, arguing, urging us or international community to respect Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, the same people openly violated the One China principle on Taiwan issue and even deliberately electedly escalated tensions across the Taiwan street. What is this? This is typical 
double standard. China will absolutely and resolutely safeguard our sovereignty, security, and development interests. Mr. Chair, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being patient with me. The Global Baku Forum offers a wonderful international platform for us to exchange views and ideas to enhance our mutual understanding. Thanks again for the Nizami Gajivi International Center, and you're all welcome to China. Thank you very much. Thank you, Excellency Wu. Uh, Mr. Wu is an experienced diplomat, serving in the system of United Nations, ambassador in Germany, being responsible for, for Macau and Hong Kong, and many, many sensitive issues in China and relations with the kind of neighboring countries, and I appreciate very much how you delivered your view regarding China. Now I'm asking uh, Madam Sodari, Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly of Cambodia, to take the floor. Thank you very much, our esteemed uh, moderator, the, form, the former President of the Republic of Serbia. Dear panelists and Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, I really have a great honor to be part of this panel, and I will join with the other panelists to extend our appreciation to the hosts for their warm welcome, hospitality, and excellent arrangement. So I want to start my intervention or my presentation in two points. First, I go from the general aspect, and then second, I will go to the concrete effect in Cambodia. So I'm sorry, I have to read my note. The panel discussion on China's role for global development and security is timely relevant as the world is in transition toward the multipolarity. And China is obviously one of the key global actors. There are attempts by some countries to contain China. But I personally don't think the containment strategy works as China has deeply integrated itself into the international system, which increasingly interdependent. As the second largest economy concrete, with the concrete efforts to promote world peace and multilateralism, China has played a stabilizing force, global peace and security. Moreover, China is a strong advocate of the respect of sovereignty, did, uh, territorial integrity, and political independence of other countries. And China has been consistent on, the, on this principle, although China's global power status is on the rise. Chinese modern, modernization and achievement in the last decades have offered an alternative path to global development and governance, contributing greater wisdom, solution, strength to address a common issue of mankind, from poverty allevi alleviation to pandemic control, digitalization, climate change response, and by all diversity conversation. More importantly, China has been constant 
in promoting a true, open, and inclusive multilateralism, which is instrumental to the world peace and development. China has initiated several global cooperation mechanisms, such as Bell and Road Initiative, Global Development Initiative, and Global Security in, uh, Initiative that add new vision, impetus to the international cooperation. Security should be the, uh, the besides. We should respect each other, legitimate security, interests. My security is your security, and your security is my security. Global security initiative issues, the importance of the respect of sovereignty and, inter, uh, and territorial integrity of all countries, the purpose of principle of Duyen Charter, the legitimate security concern of all countries, and the promotion of peaceful settlement of disputes between countries through dialogue and consultation. In relation to the regional security, plus points in Asia Pacific, I think China will continue to exercise strategic patient, flexible engagement diplomacy. <laughs> National unity and strength define China power. Winning the heart of the people is the most important defensive weapon. China will continue to focus on domestic issues, especially to reduce the inequality, strengthen social justice, and build sustainable and resilient society. To achieve nation domestic agenda, China needs to have a peaceful and favorable international environment. Now I want to come to the fact of Cambodia. Cambodia and China had upgraded our relation to that of Comprehensive Strategic Partnership. CSP of cooperation in 2010 and signed the action plan on building the Cambodian-China community of shared future. In, nine, in 2019, to further promote political cooperation, security cooperation, economic cooperation, cultural and people-to-people -people exchange, and, multi, and multilateral cooperation. Although Cambodia is a small state and China is a major power, the two countries are equal partners. Working to realize a common community with development and humanity. Before I conclude, I would like to stress that the success of China's initiative is the success of humankind, of humankind. Broadly, more especially, Bree's success story in Cambodia will further promote Cambodia-China comprehensive strategic partnership, which will serve as a role model of a modern relationship between a great power and a small state based on the principle of equal sovereignty, mutual respect, and win-win cooperation. Cambodia's success will provide a success story for both Bri and China vision of a community of shared future for mankind. So I thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Shogari. Thank you for uh, representing your view uh, from Cambodia, a country with 17 million people and relations with the China 1.5 billion. And uh, this is very important to understand, especially regarding Cambodia's position in ASEAN countries, which is uh, bringing together more than 800 million people, 10 countries, 
and uh, plus Timor-Leste next year is a going to be very interesting area of great importance, strategical importance for the glo globe and global security. I'm not talking about economy. I'm underlining issue of security and five principles. You underlined, Mr. Wu, in your previous speeches. Peter Mejashi, my friend, Prime Minister of Hungary, is going to explain uh, his view regarding China and Chinese role in uh, global development. Hungary is a member state of European Union, and maybe he's going to take into consideration this element in his presentation. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me to put some very simply, but I think uh, relevant questions and try to answer to the questions. It's easy if I put the question for myself. Uh, but uh, to speaking seriously, uh, you know, uh, the first, that is good for the world if China developing quickly or not. In my mind, this is very good. Good to have more opportunity in the trade, more uh, investment everywhere in the world, uh, more help for those who are weak, and uh, it's good to have a very excellent and performant uh, development in the technology, techniques, and everything. Uh, you know very well that uh, since uh, some decades, the uh, anal analysts say that China will collapse. Doesn't happen since many, many years. Uh, they told China will, Chinese uh, regime will collapse. Doesn't happen. Uh, so that's, uh, this is an illusion to speaking about that. Uh, we have to uh, treat uh, China as a reality and a fact. And the Chinese development is a very important fact in our world. Uh, China became, in the last 30 years, 35 years, uh, one of the most important power in the world. One or two. Uh, China uh, started after the, the, the COVID time, started to regain uh, the, the development. And for this year, probably the economic growth will be five, between five and six percent. Uh, that's, let me to say, the prosperity of China is good for the world. And we have to, to accept and to push this development. The second question, have to fear from China. Uh, a lot of people put this question. Me personally, I don't believe. Uh, the driving force of the economic growth in China, this is to, to reduce the poverty. Uh, China get a lot of results. Uh, Mr. Ambassador and the other people, uh, our chairman, uh, told uh, also that this is a very, very, very big, big uh, performance in that case. But the Chinese leaders know very well that there is some uh, poverty even today in China. So is a lot to do in, in this sense. Uh, if this is the driving force of the economic growth in China, uh, have to concentrate on, on, on this uh, question. Uh, and of course, China as a big power in the world have to look around uh, about the, the defense policy, 
about the uh, uh, foreign affairs questions and so on and so on. But China wants to solve uh, the question of Taiwan, want to have uh, uh, reunification with, with China, but in the peaceful uh, way. And nobody told that it's not, not the, the best way uh, to, to, to make this uh, peacefully. Uh, I know it's not the same like Hong Kong, because that was a different, uh, different relation. But have a, a, a proof that China able to solve the questions, need the time, and it's better to avoid the provocation to send some very important persons uh, to, to visiting tai, uh, Taiwan and to show that uh, 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 Taiwan is, is a very separate place and not part of China. Um, so I think it's not, not it's, it's why to, to fear China? China is a challenge. It's a big challenge. Have to accept everybody. But the challenge, in certain sense, is good to push the others to increase the performance, to increase the economic growth, to make the investments, to make the technical development, research, and everything. So that's the, the strong doesn't fear from this challenge. The weak, maybe. Uh, I remember 30 years ago, the biggest, uh, the, 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 the uh, company, the, the, the uh, country who was very much for the multilateralism, the competition, and so on and so on, now became much more cautious uh, to make some, some uh, uh, protectionist uh, decisions. 30 years ago, China was a very protectionist country doesn't like the concurrence, the, the competition, doesn't like too much the multilateralism. But now it's changed because the, the, the force relations changed. So I think it's, for everybody it's better to accept the challenge and to answer uh, and to using this opportunity uh, for the world. The last question is, uh, Really, uh, there is an alternative, political alternative, China, for the Western world and for the, the rest of the world. I don't think so. China, first, China doesn't want to export the Chinese regime. China is very proud to have a good regime, which is corresponding to the, uh, the old uh, uh, conditions of, of the Chinese people, but doesn't want to, 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 to push the other countries to accept uh, this, this regime. So that's, uh, from the other side, uh, the Western world is quite different. Come to use the same methods, uh, political, economic, and other methods uh, as in, 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 uh, in China. Western world is really, really something uh, different. So, as conclusion, the challenge, China is a challenge. China is a good challenge for the world. Have to accept this situation. Have to learn each other not in the regime, in the, the political regime, but from, from the, 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 the used uh, economic uh, method, and uh, have to take China as a
partner, in a very important partner, is much better to have a quickly developed and developing China than uh, isolated and closed China. This is the real uh, challenge. And just to remind, I met Putin first time in 2002. And he was very open-minded to make the reforms. And uh, was very open-minded to working together. I was uh, 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 present at the, at the uh, Russia-NATO uh, uh, summit in Rome. And that shows that he wants to make something. And the responsibility, first place, is of Putin. But have to look uh, also that the Western world did everything for, for solve the questions or to convince uh, Russia to avoid the, 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 the problems. So I don't want that we have the same uh, with China. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your view uh, regarding China, regarding uh, Chinese future, and also uh, putting that in the context uh, of the global arena and politics. But also, one of the most sensitive issues is how China and European Union are going to cooperate in the future. Uh, whenever I visited China, talking with the people from institutes and the politics, they were very much interested to have a, to increase cooperation in terms of technology with the institutes in the European Union. And uh, we'll see what is going to be final outcome of that after, I hope, after peaceful solution in the war in Ukraine. We'll see what is going to be final outcome in that respect. Now I'm asking my friend Shaukat Aziz, a legendary prime minister of Pakistan, country, nuclear power, great country, huge population, but also country that has a fascinating increasing of cooperation with the China in many, many fields and many, many aspects to say what he thinks about China and Chinese role and Pakistan and in that context. Oh, it's good. Okay. Sorry. My engineering skills haven't improved. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's a real honor to be here. It's such an important forum, the Baku Forum. And uh, I really feel honored that I've been given the chance to share some views with you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, my background, I'm a former banker. I worked for a small bank called Citibank in New York, and then worked all over the world in banking. And as such, I got interaction with China also. So I've seen China in different with different hats in different ways. It's, uh, but back to my remarks and then I'll give you some anecdotes. It's really a pleasure for me to be the, in this year's Baku Forum. We meet at a very pivotal, pivotal time for the world economy. So this meeting could not be more relevant in my view. The world is facing political and economic challenges with the major powers splintering and growing apart. Conflicts have broken out with wide-reaching consequences. New linkages and interdependencies must be created to find commonality and work together so that we create trust and respect for each other. China's Belt and Road Initiative, which I personally have worked over the last several years in our bilateral relationship with China, is such a project that seeks to boost the connectivity across nations. It has really, its implementation in Pakistan for various projects has brought us 
much more growth, much more income, and the infrastructure quality has really gone up quite. Uh, I'm, so this, uh, this whole phenomena is really changing the life in Pakistan. You go to the airport, it's different. People say, what did, what did you do? Has China done this? We have a very good port on the uh, ocean, Gwadar port, which is functioning, and we can talk about other things later. So uh, the world, ladies and gentlemen, is facing political and economic challenges, challenges with the major powers splintering and growing further apart. So conflicts have broken out with wide-ranging ranging consequences. New linkages and interdependencies must be created to find commonality and bring the splintered nations together so that we give them a reason to work with us and create mutual trust and growth. We have to create harmony with um, all these na uh, nations. And if there's lack of trust, we collectively, for all of us, it, it behooves us to pre create this, uh, reduce this uh, nervousness and lack of uh, good relations and take the world forward in a more positive way. China's Belt and Road Initiative is such a project that seeks to boost connectivity across the region. And if you have been to Pakistan, or we will be going to Pakistan, certain areas of Pakistan will look so different, and it's all the result of this effort. They have gone into many projects in Pakistan, and I won't take too much of your time. It's infrastructure, it is uh, strategic projects, it is power generation, roads, highways, uh, irrigation systems, I can go on and on, but it's really holistic. I just want to leave you with the impression that it was not a narrow thing. We think you need this, please take it. No. It was, what do you want? And we said, look, we have these issues. We, we want to focus on that. We sent a mission, talked to the Chinese missions, and we came back with pretty good rational results and very quick decisions. So. China's uh, Belt and Road uh, whole program, I've mentioned it several times now. If you want to find out what, how China treats its friends, please read on. There's enough uh, information available. You can ask us, but you can ask many other countries. So hats off to them, really, and they've been a great help. And this also seeks to boost connectivity across the region. For all of us to grow, connectivity is a creed, key driver. And this whole program focused on improved connectivity, not just with China, but with the whole region and with all the places. So uh, my own country, Pakistan, has already seen major benefits from this initiative. The two countries have worked very well together and have already uh, created many projects to give benefit to the people of Pakistan. The, uh, they have enabled productive environment, which, in a, which have seen billions of dollars of projects and aid coming into our country. The Gwadar port, a port built where there was no port, is now functioning as a major new gateway to Pakistan. All done with Chinese help, Chinese plans, and with Pakistani engineering and labor. Also, my own country, Pakistan, has already seen a major benefit coming from the Belt and Road Initiative, and countries have worked well together to produce op an operating environment which enables the two countries have and seen billions of dollars deployed in infrastructure and growth projects. It has already shown that it is a game changer for Pakistan. And we hope 
that this trend will continue going forward and new ventures will come. Many are in the pipeline and it's coming. The assistance given to this initiative is very much driven and the opposite of a cookie cutter approach, tailor made to the hilt. And now we know that reform is needed for all of us. Reform is a continuous progress. And believe me, with Chinese help, we got results which we which would never have expect, expected in the past. So I know you, you will say, yes, we've heard about that, but let me tell you that every Pakistani today you meet will tell you we are very proud of our relationship with China. China has stood by us. China has carried us forward. Now, there are many other a big powers. I don't want to you know, start another discussion. We can do, do it in the Q&A if possible. So but China has just really done so much. And Pakistan has also ref, uh, responded accordingly that the current uh, outlook for our growth and the current outlook for the development projects coming in the pipeline, it is really going to be fantastic when everything is done. And all this was done by using not just Chinese projects and hundreds of people coming from China. So no, they said, use your local talent, use your local engineers, use your local laborers. Of course, we get Chinese help when it's, the stuff is very sophisticated because we need that. Also on the defense side, Pakistan has a good relationship with China, and Pakistan is a peaceful country, so whenever we talk about defense, it's about protecting ourselves, not attacking. And that, Pakistan's position on that front has Im improved and increased substantially also. Pr previously, we did it, dealt with the West. Now we are dealing with them, and they have been great. On infrastructure, let me tell you, the experience we've had on roads, highways, new trains, all across the country, you'll be shocked if you haven't been there before. The change, the change is dramatic. So having said all this, I would just like to now say in uh, conclusion that the assistance we got is all user-driven, not lender-driven. This I have to emphasize. We've dealt with many countries who give us a lot of loans, etc. but it's all, everything is driven by them. They say, you need this, we'll give it to you. In this case, it was all user-driven. And the assistance is through initiative and done and driven by the people who are getting it. All stakeholders must realize that no one is exempt from the need for reform. No matter how advanced you are, you have to develop further. So that is why we have to use all, uh, for a country like Pakistan, which is uh, surrounded by some friendly neighbors and some not so friendly neighbors, we have a lot of challenges. And so we have to watch our steps. But I would, for those of you who don't know China well, I would say just one or two things in conclusion, that we have found that China is a friend which is always there when we need it. And they stand by their commitments, and they don't, it's not, the, uh, the quid pro quo is very transparent. So there's nothing, no secret agendas. We have dealt with all the big powers, Pakistan is, but nobody has treated us like this. Looking forward, the people in Pakistan now feel that our closest friend, if any major power, who's our closest friend? Everybody from the taxi driver to the people up will say uh, China. So that's the net conclusion of all this. We, are, we feel privileged with their relationship. We have relationships with everybody, UK, USA. I, don't, I didn't want to go into that because you, the topic was on China. So you can look to them for technology. You can look to them for many other things. And I hope your experiences are as good as Pakistan's. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, Chinese initiative Belt and Road, which was launched in the uh, famous speech of President Xi Jinping in his visit in Kazakhstan in 2013, 
is a covering now they can't more yeah. than 150 countries yes pakistan is on the way one of the most important country but china by creation creating such yeah, an initiative a it is a neighboring country with 150 countries uh, this is creating tremendous change in the global arena in uh, economy in uh, security in cooperation and uh, that is uh, one of the i mean magnitude in the global arena in the past few years that is uh, creating uh, added value and new chances for different countries. We see and we heard a lot of criticism regarding the role of China in that respect in many countries, but at the same time, I'm kind of witness. I'm, I signed a strategic partnership with China during my term and to be partner on the Balkans in China and that initiative that we triggered in that time during my term is extended right now to other Eastern European countries and we see so many investments, Chinese investments in that area, not only in Central Asia, Pakistan and other countries. This is uh, something that I have to underline once again. But now we have a Rashid Ali Alimov uh, who has been running an extremely important organization, Shanghai Cooperation Organization which was in charge for economy, security, and development, bringing a lot of countries, a sure. lot of huge population, 40% of the human beings yeah. on the earth and more than 30% of GDP of the globe. And uh, Rashid Alimov is uh, well known in our uh, NGIC organization as uh, one of the best experts regarding influence of China, China and their capabilities to develop different countries and the region. Please. Thank you so much, my dear friend, our moderator. First of all, I would like to highlight that it has become a good tradition during the Global Baku Forum to discuss in a separate panel session Chinese role in global development and security. China, as you know, has been and remains the locomotive of global economic development. As a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, plays an important role in a maintaining peace and security in the world. Let me focus on the relationship between China and the Central Asia countries. It's very interesting because we observe last five, ten years, many powerful countries focused to Central Asia. It's a big surprise for all of us, but China, it's our neighbor. And of course, relationship between China and uh, Central Asia countries play a big role to the development and security in a big region in our world. Because that relationship reflect Chinese role in a global development and security like a mirror. A year ago, China and the Central Asia countries celebrated the 30th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations. According to all sides, this road has been covered in three decades, which is equal to a century. Relations between the countries have reached the level of a comprehensive strategic partnership. At the present, cooperation between China and the Central Asia countries covers over 
hundred spheres. It means all spheres. China and the Central Asia countries, as you know, are developing states. Their key interests largely coincide, and their development strategies have much in common. Chinese achievements in reform and social economic development, poverty, elevation, and new technologies provide an excellent opportunity for the development of Central Asia countries. At the same time, the parties respect the right of each state to choose its own path of development, taking into account historical experience and, this is very important, national characteristics, create favorable condition for the development of each other and strive to ensure that economic cooperation is mutually beneficial. Geographical proximity and good neighbors contribute to this because three country of Central Asia is a neighbor of China. From the beginning, China and Central Asia countries have demonstrated a high level of attraction of national economies since 2000, having solved the issues of transport connectivity, the parties have been rapidly increasing bilateral trade. According to Chinese custom data, in 2001, the trade turnover of the Central Asia countries with China amounted to 1.5 billion dollars and increased by more than 25 years, uh, 25 times over the next 20 years. China is also becoming one of the important export destinations for the Central Asia countries. Since 2006, it has grown by 43%. Moreover, in 2020, this figure amounted to 16.5 billion dollars. China has become one of the key sources of direct investment in the economies of the Central Asia countries. The total volume of which at the end of 2020 approached $40 billion. Investment growth is directly related to Chinese companies that successfully operated in the region. They number, this is very important, at the end of 2021, reached close to 8,000 in five countries. It is important that Chinese capital comes to the Central Asia countries along with new technologies and the best solutions in the field of agriculture and water management. This is very important to Central Asia, water management, industry and engineering helps to accelerate the transition to new industrial tracks and build a digital and green economy. Trade between China and Central Asia countries is expected to reach $70 billion by 2030. It means 
after five, six years. This will be facilitated by the dialogue mechanism for cooperation in the field of electronic commerce, the forum for industrial and investment cooperation, as well as the forum for trade and economic cooperation between China and the Central Asia countries. This year marks 10 years anniversary of the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. As you will remember, and uh, our chairman said about that, the initiative was uh, put forward by Chinese President Xi Jinping in September 2013 in Kazakhstan. It's very important, it was very important for us because as you know, that all Central Asia countries are landlocked countries. And thanks to the Belt and Road, the Central Asia countries now play an important role as an Asia, Europe, intercontinental land bridge. The enormous joint work carried out by China and the Central Asia countries has opened a wide road to the future of mutually prospects, mutually beneficial foreign trade that meets their fundamental interests. In the short term, plans the promotion of the China-Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan rail project, railway project, and China Central Asia transport corridors, as well as accelerating the construction of the fourth China Central Asia gas pipeline, expanding energy cooperation along all production chains. At present, deep and consistent work continues in Central Asia to create a common space for a secure, sustainable, broad, and open partnership. One of its important elements will be the dialogue on security and cooperation in Central Asia. Chinese support will be essential for strengthening regional cooperation, creating an atmosphere of genuine trust and common development in the our region. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Limov. Uh, I fully agree with you that the uh, uh, role of China regarding Central Asia uh, is uh, extremely important. China has an inevitable role. Uh, especially in the context of geostrategical importance of Central Asia. I fully agree with this big Brzezinski definition. This is a soft stomach of global security. And uh, nowadays becoming even more important, even more important, not only for Tajikistan, your own country, but also for all other countries. China is a, is a country well known uh, regarding future because of uh, exploitation of the rare metals and the materials without which we cannot imagine the globe in the future. Cell phones, uh, the plasma screens, and everything what we are using in a modern era, communication, connectivity, and all those fields that we have to mention right now. When we are thinking about China, this is not only about shipping industry, big population containers, but this is about investment in the new technology, science, and China in that respect is a becoming totally inevitable global power. I would like to ask Petr Roman, Prime Minister of Romania, who is coming not only from political uh, arena, but also from the science, to say how he sees uh, Chinese role, and uh, also Petr is uh, coming from the country which is member state of European Union, but at the same time is a country of Western Europe, where China has a huge and significant investments. Well, thank you. Thank you, Boris. Uh, 
we started our friendship uh, 25 years ago when um, I did my best uh, to help uh, the Serbian opposition fighting democratically with the Slobodan Milosevic. They, they won. Unfortunately, my good friend uh, Zoran Djindjic, who was the leader of uh, the Democratic Party, like my party, uh, was um, assassinated. I, 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 I need to mention, yes, uh, democracy sometimes asks for sacrifices. Um, well, by simple consideration of uh, what has been said uh, by my colleagues of the panel, it, it, it seems that it comes to me, it's somehow an obligation, if I'm able to, to speak on really the subject, which is the China's role on the security subject, the security issue uh, on, the inter in, uh, on the international arena. Uh, to do that, I, I start, um, Boris Tadic mentioned the miracle of China. Indeed, indeed, it is a miracle in the history of the humanity because it never happened before in just 40 years. Historically speaking, it's nothing. In just 40 years, even less, uh, the great leap forward of China in terms of economic, social, scientific, technological terms to reach the second, to be the second largest economy of the world on a par of the United States. Hmm? And everybody was, everybody regarded China as a, a country of the miracle until, uh, it was not many years ago, until uh, very quickly, unfortunately, under the impact of uh, President Trump, remember slogan, MAGA, make a great, make again, great America, make MAGA, make again, great America. No, make America great again, right, absolutely, but it's still MAGA. Uh, and uh, to this, um, to this capital should be added A, C, D and China down. Uh, and very soon, China was labeled as a threat to the free world, uh, to be an unfaithful global competitor. And it's the only subject which is bipartisan in the American Congress. So, <clears throat> As I promised, uh, on the security issue, uh, of course, we all know that the present world destiny, I would say, it looks to be under the impact of two uh, global political realities, the war of Russia against Ukraine and uh, the unfolding of a possible new Cold War, I pointed to, US versus China. And of course, I think it should be much more than that because we are still confronted with, with, with enormous global threats other than political. But still, uh, I said uh, maybe one or two years ago, one year ago, I said the new, the, the pushing to, towards the new Cold War is, on my view, an unhappy political decision. And indeed, even John Biden told in November 2022, I mean, very recently, to uh, told Xi Jinping, the president of China, there need not be a new Cold War. Uh, my, my friend, uh, Peter Megyes, he said that he met uh, uh, Vladimir Putin. I never met uh, Vladimir Putin, but I met three times President Xi Jinping. And uh, 
in our meeting, I was with uh, some other former presidents and uh, prime ministers. We were about six or seven, and the former general secretary Ban Ki Moon. And uh, it was a very long, incredibly long, and absolutely fabulous meeting with him. It was in 2018, I think, yes. And uh, he told us a Chinese story, Chinese, uh, the, uh, Chinese wisdom, no? Two friends uh, are uh, at the sunset, uh, sunset in a boat fishing. And it's a beautiful landscape on a lake, uh, absolutely par perfect. And one said to the others, how happy should be uh, the fish in this lake? And the other replies, how do you know that? You are not a fish. Very, very interesting wisdom. Uh, I have it from President Xi Jinping. Okay. It is, I think, far from clear that framing the world as a competition between democracy and autocracy is the best way to address those global threats of our age. And even, I say, I don't know if this is really in the interest of the free world, the Western countries, including, of course, my, uh, my country. It's, it's uh, excessively simplistic because we live in a messy multipolar reality of today. Look, the uh, reaction of many countries with respect to Ukraine, I don't need to develop that. Uh, look that according to the latest, uh, latest uh, analysis of public opinion in the world, it was the Munich Security Index. People are uh, much more concerned about uh, issues like financial crisis, uh, rampant inflation. Uh, but still, when Russia invaded Ukraine in February 2002, just days before that, uh, during the visit of uh, Putin to China, uh, China uh, and, I mean, the, the two presidents, China and uh, Xi Jinping and, uh, and Putin announced a, a very solid alliance and it looked like uh, China is uh, sided with, uh, with Russia and after that, Many people demurred uh, about, about that. It's, it, it's, uh, it's a fact. But we should, let's say, have a more in-deep analysis. Because China's leaders attempted to balance two, in fact, irreconcilable interests. First. They aim to bolster China, uh, China's uh, agreement with, with Russia to counterbalance what, what was coming from America, especially from America. And secondly, of course, China wanted to avoid unilateral and coordinated sanctions aimed at China's government companies and financial institutions. That was the dilemma. Uh, at the time, uh, a, a, a very important uh, journalist from New York Times, Thomas Friedman, I quote, China cannot be connected and disconnected at the same time. I hope, he said, Beijing joins in with the West and so much of the rest of the world in opposing what's going on in, uh, in Russia. But recently, China indeed called for a ceasefire and the start of peace negotiations, and, and President Zelensky was positive. I quote, I want to believe that China is going to side with the idea of peace. By now, of, uh, President Zelensky not, not, didn't visit yet China, but I hope it, uh, it's coming. That's my hope. And of course, always, as always, China uh, with, the voice of, with the voice of President Xi Jinping, again and again said on this occasion that, <clears throat> uh, 
the sovereignty and territorial integrity of, uh, of all countries must be respected. So this is a, a very clear statement. On the 26th of February this year, Financial Times published on the same issue an, ed an editorial, Grounds for Hope After a Year in Ukraine, and also an opinion of a well-known analyst, Adam Tooze, entitled West's Limited Support for Ukraine. The first the editorial says that China doesn't want a prolonged conflict in Ukraine, nor to see Ukraine's viability as a state undermined. And Adam Tooze, looking severely from the opposite perspective, he doesn't support the total war, but he said, I quote, after a year of war, what stands out is less solidarity from the West than the gap between rhetoric and real delivery. For instance, the US, United States spent 0.21% of GDP on military support for Ukraine in one year, which is slightly less than it spent in an average year on its Afghanistan intervention, with the well-known failure. Even Germany, in this year, gave three times as much as its offering to Ukraine, three times offered to the US-led operation to oust Saddam Hussein from the oil fields of, of Kuwait. So, but, but, we need a credible path. We need a credible path to stop the war. And China's proposal, let me be clear, it's the first proposal, it's the first proposal, is the first such formula in favor of negotiations. That's it. So if China gets a third way, it's a third way, okay, to take shape, wonderful. It will bear a very respectable signature of China. Because China finds herself again between its core, th that's my view, it, it finds herself between its core economic and geostrategic interests of stability and security on one hand, and the long-standing principles China was always committed to on the international arena. And I would be rather, let's say, blunt. We cannot simultaneously ask China to put its weight in order to solve the crisis in Ukraine, and in the meantime, to be aggressive and menacing with a new Cold War. It doesn't make sense to me. Uh, if the aim, a, a, a very interesting uh, historian, it's a military historian, uh, working for 30 or 40 years within the US Army, uh, very well known. Adam Bevcic. If the aim of US hegemony has been to establish global order and justice, the war in Ukraine offers a variety of lessons, but perhaps the most crucial one is this. Global order is neither inherently robust nor inherently fragile. It, is, it has exactly as much strength as those who value it and sustain it when it is tested. And I quote again, of course, we are in, 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 in the midst of a strategic competition, fine, to shape the future of international order. And I quote again this uh, historian, around the world, the need for American leadership is as great as it has ever been. But the United States needs to get its house in order, says this well-known historian. 
a combination of grotesque inequality and feckless profligacy, pro profligacy goes a long way toward explaining why such an immense and richly endowed country finds itself unable to contend with dysfunction at home and crisis abroad. Okay, so to, to finish. Crisis, political or, or financial, are inevitable. The two superpowers, United States and China, should be able to communicate and coordinate to anticipate and forestall disruptions. There are, there are shared, shared, shared interests of United States and China. Thank you. Thank you, Petr. Uh, uh, security issue is one of the most important, especially regarding current crisis we are facing with. Um, just to remind ourselves, China is investing in different spheres, not only in mining, building infrastructure, fascinating infrastructure, uh, but also in the defense sector. I mean, uh, China has grown with the aircraft carriers uh, within 10 years from one to three, investing even more, which means this is the intention to be global power. Who has uh, aircraft carriers, is controlling ocean, who has uh, influence on ocean, has a capability to be global power. In that respect, this is a crystal clear that in the future, China is going to be after United States and Russia, also global power. One country is uh, watching what's going on from the shadow. This is India. They are also investing in aircraft carriers. They are investing in science, producing every year 16 million software engineers, which is unbelievable. But this is a crystal clear evidence that we are going to live in a totally different world. But to remind ourselves, China was always through the history of the main kind of the top of civilization regarding scientific researches, discoveries, and everything else, culture. But only within two centuries after discovering steam aging, China wasn't at the top of civilization. And this new phenomena is a not new phenomena. China is not new phenomena. China is uh, coming to the position which deserved through the history of mankind. I talked uh, today with uh, Georgi Ivanov about history, well educated former president of Northern Macedonia. And we agreed that the uh, oscillatory curve is uh, characterizing the global politics and the history. But that oscillatory curve is uh, speeding up from time to time, and we are living in the such period of the history, speeding up. All processes are coming very fast, and we have to be able to predict these processes. This is very important to understand that. And this is why I'm asking my Minister of Foreign Affairs and former President of uh, General Assembly of United Nations to say something about this. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. President, for letting me ask the question, and I want to thank all the participants in the panel on a most fascinating uh, conversation. Uh, as a former foreign minister of Serbia, I can attest uh, to the fact that uh, of all the big powers, uh, it was only one that has treated us as sovereign equal throughout uh, my being uh, at the helm of the Serbian Foreign Ministry, and that was the Republic of China, People's Republic of China, uh, for which uh, in Serbia we are very grateful. And then when I was president of the United Nations General Assembly, there was only one permanent member of the Security Council that has not come to my office asking in an imperative way that I must do something, despite the fact that I was elected by the majority uh, of uh, 
the nations uh, of the United Nations, and that was, again, People's Republic of China. But uh, in order to get um, out a little bit of the zone of comfort here, uh, and uh, Prime Minister Roman uh, actually said something uh, that, uh, that I completely agree with, and he mus muttered these words, the Cold War. Uh, very serious experts on, uh, on China, and starting with Henry Kissinger, uh, they said a couple of years ago that we were in the foothills of the Cold War. And last year, Mr. Kissinger said, we are now in the high mountain passes of the Cold War. Essentially, this sounds like a Cold War, this smells like a Cold War, this looks like a Cold War. There's a very strong uh, chance that this is actually a Cold War. And, and furthermore, this conflict in Ukraine uh, reminds certain historians of the first hot war of the original Cold War which was the war in Korea. It happened on the other continent, but it was essentially the first hot conflict in which the future participants in the Cold War took sides on the opposite, um, opposite to each other in the conflict. I don't wanna make any historical comparisons, but I want to uh, address uh, the hard truth. One side in this potential, or real, already Cold War, and that is the United States, is actively seeking it. They are after it. There is even a bipartisan consensus in this regard. And um, no matter uh, what you do or what you say, since Donald Trump's uh, uh, getting into power in 2017, uh, this uh, political um, determination to get into a confrontation with China and the United States seems unwavering and strengthening and solidifying. So my question is, what can one do to avoid a Cold War? And this would be something that all of us coming from small countries and developing countries would hate to have. But how to avoid a Cold War if one party is dead set on entering it? And um, I'm gonna ask my good friend Shaukat Aziz to answer this question. His wisdom gives me hope that we might get an answer to this complex question. Please, Shaukat. Can you repeat yeah. the question? Could you repeat the question and I'll answer it right away. The question was like, how can you avoid a Cold War if one side is dead set on having it? Uh, how can you avoid a Cold War? We are just talking about the Cold War, huh? I was asking, um, how can you avoid a Cold War between the United States and China if the United States wants it? <laughs> This makes, more, uh, ma makes it more interesting. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very good question, but a very hypothetical question. Uh, my own view is that both the United States and China are responsible powers. And if you talk about war, I think there will be many uh, things they'll have to jump over to get to a serious action. Uh, war is something much more diverse and uh, heavy than having you know, skirmishes at the border or some little things like that. I'm not talking war, that's not war. What you are referring to is phys real end. Two countries stand in front of each other and said one of us will survive, nobody else will survive. Or other things can happen too. I don't see that happening. I think the United States is, as we know, a sensible country, and they realize the, whatever the risks are. And China, frankly, I've spent a lot of time there. I find them very cool when it comes to, at least in discussions I had, very cool in how they look at the uh, reaction or the, the feeling of uh, the uh, about China in uh, 
by the United States, etc. Everybody f feels that the U.S. obviously doesn't, uh, may, and China, or vice versa, they have certain rivalries and certain differences, but deep down, they both have a lot of maturity. They will never do anything rash. They won't do anything just to please them, the media here and there. I think China itself, I've dealt with them for many years, as some of you know. Uh, they are pretty well, well established in what they want and what they don't want. They are also, obviously, they are ambitious like everybody is. Same on the U.S. side. I think uh, the U.S., in my humble view, has also realized that while we have to watch China and also not let them stop us, stop the U.S. to do what they want to do, but they will not just sort of uh, do anything which will turn into a military operation, because when you come into a military situation, nobody's a winner. Everybody loses. So we are, we, if there are any issues, I think this needs diplomacy. This needs a Henry Kissinger type person who will talk to both sides, come up with, some, obviously, uh, everybody has their own view, and try to settle things and open the channels. The, I think the channels between the two countries could use some looking at, and uh, the interaction as a result, I think, could have very good positive returns for both sides. Thank you. Sorry, Boris, may, may I add something? Uh, yes, but... Uh, Just uh, a second, no. Mr. Uh, Hu would, would like to, oh, okay. to make comment on that. Well, thank you very much, my good friends. Um, really good question. Um, I think we have to face the reality. It is a cold war. We are in the Cold War period. You know, considering China being squeezed from all sides and the Chinese enterprise has been singled out uh, to add to the list for sanctions for sometimes no reasons. So as far as we are concerned, we don't like the, the Cold War. We try to avoid the Cold War. We're trying to approach the United States of America at a top level. We only hope that the United States could keep its words. Do not break their words too quickly. Soon after the meeting at the top level, they will go back their words. There are a lot of examples. For the time being, I will not say that. And another possibility is that the Cold War will slip into a hot war. The previous world war took place twice on the European continent. Is there a possibility that China and the United States will be locked on the head-on clash militarily? I would say in theory there's a possibility. In practice, it's not likely. If you look around the recent histories, the United States of America launched invasions always in smaller countries. They never touch Russia. China is just as large as Russia. And if you can recall the recent history, in 1950s, there was the Korean War. The Chinese fought with the primitive weapons, with the most powerful army on the world, the US Army. We did not lose. If you look at recent history, the United States never win the war around China's territory. They lost the war in Vietnam without direct involvement in China. They did not have victory in Cambodia. They recently lost their military operations in Afghanistan. So I don't think it is easier for the policy planners of the United States of America to launch a hard war against China. Of course, as we are concerned, we're trying to avoid any possibility that will give the reason a rise 
to hard wall. In the final analysis, if there is a hard wall imposed on China, we'll certainly be forced to defend ourselves. We are more capable than we were in 1950s to defend our own interests. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Wu. Uh, thank you, Roman. Well, maybe there is a, there is a simple answer. I, I just said it at the end of my intervention, shared interests between US and China. And I, I give you just one figure. Overall trade with China of the United States last year surpassed previous records during a Cold War, which makes a very big difference with respect to the former Cold War between Soviet Union. Between them at the time, the ties were very, very slim, very thin. So, uh, U.S. trade deficit, that is a problem. U.S. trade deficit with China grew to 390 billion last year. So maybe shared interest could do that, could do something in order to avoid that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Sodari. Thank, thank you very much, Honorable Chair. I really support the previous comment from our previous, two previous panelists. Because for my point of view, I don't think that the Cold War will happen again between United States and China. Why? I have the reason to say like that. Because, you see, like what he had mentioned before, through the history as well, and for the, the reality, the actuality, you see, even there's uh, the afraid from the other country that there will be the, the third Cold War happen between China and United States. But choose to the patient policy, choose to the United States position also, they will not make this Cold War happen because everything will destroy, you see? If they really need to have peace, world peace or security. So we have gone through already the history, this history. For Cambodia as the example, we have gone through the strategic history that every panel here, the challenges that been raised within two days. The Cambodian people have already has a lesson learned. Because why? Nearly half a century, and I still the witness of this such history that otherwise Cambodia won't have the place exists in this earth. But why we still survive right now? Because everybody, even the American people or the Chinese people, everybody want to have peace. Without peace and secure uh, peace, you cannot find anything. Even democracy, even human rights, even development, even security. So, you talk about refugee, you talk about migration, something, so and so. And you know that this burden is a tragedy, but we have gone through already. And this is the lesson learned, why? We have to make a clear position. Chinese is one of the actor for world peace. It doesn't mean that Cambodia reject that United States is not the actor. But we pray and we beg that the two 
big power, how to compete, you know, compete each other is okay, but in the fairness way, that everybody can accept it. So that's all what I want Thank to you. comment. Thank you. Now, uh, I will give the floor uh, uh, to my friend, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister of Norway, Shell Magne Bondevik, uh, from where is also Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg. Shell. Book is monopolizing microphone. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, many thanks to all of you in the panel. It was a very lively and interesting uh, discussion about a very important uh, topic. And um, I want especially to thank Wu Hung Bu for coming here, because in China is a topic. <laughs> it's so good to have a high-level representative from China. And uh, it could have been uh, discussed many aspects of what was uh, raised in the panel. So. I will be brief and uh, concentrate on, on one topic that uh, you uh, touched upon in your intervention, namely uh, the ongoing war in, uh, in Ukraine. Um, I'm glad that we have this opportunity to talk with you about it, because it's no doubt that China also in this issue can play a key role, no doubt. Um, and you referred to the peace initiative, as far as I remember, it was 12 points. Uh, some have said that um, China has not been clear on criticizing that Russia, no doubt, started this war and want you to condemn it. Uh, so that is my first point, if you will comment on that. Uh, but my second point goes to these 12 points plan. One of them, as far as I remember, was to respect territorial integrity, respect territorial integrity. And that is a key point. So my question to you is, with territorial integrity, do you mean the borders of Ukraine and Russia before the war started? This is a key point and uh, could be important to pave the way for further Peace talks. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Wu. Ambassador. Well, thank you very much for uh, raising this very important issue. And China had the diplomatic relations with both Russia and Ukraine. The Ukraine crisis was not created by China. China is not direct party to that crisis. Now, why China has taken the position as we do now. At the very beginning, my president immediately made our positions very clear. The number one is the principle, as you mentioned, the sovereignty and the territorial integrity of a country must be respected. Number two, the rules and regulations of United Nations Charter must be abided by. Number three, legitimate concern for security of a country should be taken into consideration. Number four, efforts must be made to promote the possible peace negotiations for settlement. This is the integrated whole of the position. It's not a single out of one, leaving the others aside. So this is my first point. The territorial integrity or sovereignty, they are always there. Members of the United Nations, I think everybody has a very clear picture. However, each country's legitimate, I emphasize, legitimate concern for security is ignored or not taken a good care of. We are talking about the security 
in European continent. The outbreak of this war means the existing European security umbrella arrangement collapsed completely. Russia is the neighbor of other European countries, which cannot be relocated. If you want European continent to avoid Third World War, you need a comprehensive umbrella that will look after all legitimate concerns of both Russia and Ukraine all together. Imagine the future European security umbrella keeps Russia outside, a huge country in nuclear power. I don't think that kind of uh, arrangement could last long. I explained this point in my previous remarks. Um, I believe the Chinese policies or the ideas so to promote or to find the possibility of political settlement, not of a military settlement. We understand almost 10 rounds of sanctions have taken place. It cuts both ways. Russia survived, but the Europeans suffered a great deal. That depends on each country. But that would lead us to nowhere. We said we against unilateral sanctions. And military support. OK, if we are ready to fight to the last Ukraine soldier, that is the way to do it. This is a war. I don't think Ukraine can win militarily without direct involvement of NATO. And this is the war that Russian cannot afford to lose. Now, we are in the deadlock situation. So that's why China thinks it's perhaps it's time to put forward our proposal. Let's sit down and have a discussions, trying to find political solution or settlement to this military deadlock. Maybe some countries don't like this idea, but time will prove we are on the right side of history. Time will prove that we are working for peace. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Wu. Now I have to react because uh, the issue of territorial integrity is mentioned. I used to be president of Serbia, which was bombed by the NATO. And the outcome of that bombing was a violation of territorial integrity of my country, or on Kosovo. When some Western countries not only violated international law, by recognizing Kosovo independence, but also they opened the Pandora box in terms of global security. After that happened, I delivered my speech in Security Council of United Nations by saying, by doing this, my friends from the European Union and the countries in the West and, and United States, you are making our world more dangerous than before. And I exactly mentioned Next cases that are going to be headed, Crimea, South Ossetia, and Abkhazia. That wasn't that difficult to predict the recent history, but it happened. Unfortunately, I have to say, I'm always in favor of European integration of my country, westernization of Serbia, modernization, democratization, but I have to underline once again, the policy of double standard is the only policy existing in international arena forever. That is exactly what we have to change in order to achieve really sustainable peace. In the world nowadays, 
in the world in the future. When I've heard that someone is attacking on the countries that are not respecting territorial integrity of Ukraine nowadays, I fully agree with them. But I am coming back only a few years ago when those countries didn't respect territorial integrity of my country. And that is continuation in Serbia nowadays. This is very dangerous. I want to say once again, thank you for China and Chinese role in that respect. But we have to understand that our, our own problem can be problem for the global community in the future. And to take this seriously into the consideration. Ambassador Wu. I just want to add one point. <clears throat> We should not take the Ukraine crisis isolated. Talking about a permanent member of the United Nations violating <coughs> the rules and the regulations of the UN Charter. We have a precedent before. The United States of America invaded Iraq on the pretext of weapons of mass destruction. Was the United States of America denounced? Was the United States of America taken to the account? Was the United States was sanctioned by the UN resolutions? No. Their Secretary of State waving a small bottle of white powder. We don't know what, maybe it's so sugar or, or, or washing powder. He, he was cheating the whole world in Security Council room. Not even the apology was received by the international community. So if you treat the two permanent members on the equal footing, what we should do to the United States of America? It is exactly the Russians. They say we follow the example of the United States. So this is a more complex issue. So we, what we're trying to do is to promote peace talk and settlement so that we could stop the bleeding of innocent people and the soldiers on both sides as early as possible. Not to act on them to fight against each other and perhaps fight to the last soldier of each side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time about this issue, but. Uh, to say once again, aggression of Russia against Ukraine is uh, totally unacceptable. That is something that everyone has to, uh, to criticize right now regarding future of our common globe. But not right now I would like to, ta to give a floor to Abdulaziz Alfairi, uh, the president of ISESCO for uh, many, many years. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to... Uh, cheer the uh, honorable panelists on this beautiful and very informative uh, session that uh, we all were engaged with mentally and psychologically. China is a superpower, no, no doubt about that. I mean, it is now all over the world with its economic power, with its projects, with its, its influence. But it's also now gaining another dimension as a mediator. I have received a, a piece of news just now, that China have, has succeeded in bringing Saudi Arabia and Iran together, and they announced that they will resume the di diplomatic relations and open the embassies. So now China is not only a superpower, but also a mediator working for uh, a better s situation in the Middle East, you know, where peace and security will be maintained. I, I, I was a, a harsh criti critic of uh, of, of, uh, of Iran's policies in the, in the Islamic world, and uh, I have many reservations against their policies, but I think if they come down and s sit down and discuss all these issues and find a solution that will save the, the Middle East, another war that will kill hundreds of thousands of people and make uh, maybe millions to, to migrate uh, their countries and to create animosity between the Shia and the Sunnah, uh, this is a good move by China that has to be uh, appreciated and thanked for it. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Ambassador, and thank you for your country for this kind of mediation, which is a success in the region. 
Thank you, Mr. Alfredi. Right now, I'm giving floor to Amri Musa, uh, famous diplomat and uh, Secretary General of Arab League. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Boris. I uh, must say that the question uh, posed by our friend Rick was so essential. And the answer was very clear by the distinguished envoy on two matters. Number one, there is already a Cold War going on in the world. The second one is stressing the principle of territorial integrity and political independence of countries. For a Cold War, perhaps we are now going into two Cold Wars at the same time. A Cold War between the West and Russia, another one between the United States and China. West and Russia, US and China. What you have said, sir, that the principle of the respect for territorial integrity and political independence of countries is music to our <laughs> ears in the South. The principle of territorial integrity has been stressed by so many, but it has been violated, and it was the victim of the principle, sorry to say principle, but the policy of double standard. In fact, the policy of double standard will have to be put on the table for an agreement, a world agreement, that such a policy should not again be given any chance to ruin international relations. That is the first point. The second point is about the China-US, Cold Wars, big powers, superpowers, I want to mention and stress one point, that the global south, the southern part of the world, has a responsibility, if not to prevent, then at least to, co to contain the, the policies that promote uh, the Cold Wars. The south, the rights of the south, the interests of the south, the development of the south, those are principles that have to be borne in mind while we are considering or debating all the elements concerning the Cold War. We have a role. In the last century, there was the movement of non-alignment. But we are talking now about a non-alignment model 21st century, bearing in mind that the rise of China and the principles that you have talked about and we are talking about the situation is really dangerous. And the US, I don't think, will accept a defeat or to be a second uh, superpower. China, I believe, is so wise in managing positions pertaining to the Ukraine and West and Russia, but we want more. The South, the interests of the South, the people of the South will have to be taken into consideration and our role will be underlined, I believe, very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amre. Okay, I think that uh, dinner is waiting. <laughs> but uh, to finalize uh, our discussion, which I think was uh, very interesting, and uh, finally we were putting the fuel in our discussion and dialogue not in the war <laughs> and the crisis, which is very important. In general, we are facing with the many, many challenges. I'm not that optimistic in terms of uh, security situation in the global arena, especially in the context of the war in Ukraine, which is, I'm underlining once again, totally unacceptable. This is aggression against the sovereign country. Even though I understand fear in Russia regarding relations with the NATO, but I underline once again, if we would like to have a sustainable peace and uh, multilateral institutions functioning properly, we have to avoid a policy of double standards. We have to respect each other. We have to understand we are not only in the world. We have to understand there are many identities and many political systems that are functioning. Democracy, I'm Democrat, is a one political system. But also in China, there is no democratic elections like we have in Europe and the United States. 
but there is a democratic selection of the people. And this is about quality of the people that can deliver something which is necessarily for China and to mankind, that I appreciate very much what happened in the past few decades. And uh, finally, my friends, we are NGIC, we are Baku Forum, we are people with experience, and we have to commit ourselves to achieve a peace, to find the solutions and to offer our expertise to the world and the global leaders nowadays. My name is Boris, which means fighter and a warrior. <laughs> I, I'm fighting for peace and democracy and fighting for coexistence and sustainable reconciliation process. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.